Okay. So again, guys, if uh, anybody can't see the screen, I'm hoping that's not the case. Uh, you let us know, and I'll be I'll be monitoring the uh, the chat. Just to introduce ourselves, I'm Karen Romano. I'm the head of marketing for Outremer. And Outremer is a brand of uh, fast sailing performance catamaran that belongs to the Grand Large Yachting Group. And Grand Large is the uh, the mother company, the parent company of Outremer. Uh, we'll be talking about that just just to give you some 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 context as to uh, uh, as to uh, who we are. Uh, and I'm here with Pete Goss, who uh, uh, accepted to uh, launch this uh, webinar series for us on blue water sailing and thank you pete for being here again i very much appreciate it pleasure all right uh, so we have more people coming in um okay just a few quick words about grand large because you may not you may not know we're actually a european um a european group it started in 2003 and and really the story behind these numbers um, is that it started with two friends who were studying together and they were looking for the right boat to go on, to go on a blue water um, world tour, blue water cruise. They didn't find it and then they decided to build it actually. And that's how Allure was started. Allure is one of the five brands um, that is in the group. You can see them here uh, in the order in which they, uh, they um, they, uh, they got into the group actually. So it started with one boat with Allure. And then uh, these two friends, Xavier Desmarais and Stéphane, Stéphane Constance, um, decided to expand with one main mission, which was to help people realize their blue water sailing uh, adventure, if you will. And so that's the common thread for all these brands. The common DNA is that whether um, there are monohulls or catamarans, such as Outremer and Gunboat, well, basically, uh, they're all vessels to help people um, uh, go on their blue water cruise, if you will, and, and move on with our project. So that's the common thread. And this is why we're, we're, we're speaking today about blue water cruising, obviously. Um, and the group has like some, actually an exciting, uh, an exciting event. Uh, we have about 32 boats um, from all five brands of the, of the group, actually. And these boats are going to be leaving very shortly, uh, for the first worldwide rally put together by, uh, by Grand Large Yachting. Um, and what's exciting about this is that this event has actually been recognized as one of the key events, um, to celebrate the 500th anniversary of Magellan's um, first circumnavigation. So it's quite exciting. And the routes were designed by Jimmy Cornell, who's also a um, famous sailor. Uh, so we're happy to, uh, to, uh, to obviously be able to, to put this together for, for you know, our owners. And uh, for those of you who haven't been yet on a blue water cruise, we're suspecting that if you are here, it's, it's that you're thinking about it and probably, you know, you haven't done it yet, or maybe you've done it and you want to do it again, then um, you'll be able to follow the adventures of those who are blazing the trail before you, uh, both on the de dedicated website and on our social networks. And we can give you more information about that later on. Just to give you a quick update, I see that people are keep, keep logging in, so welcome to all of you. Uh, keep, give you a quick update about this six-part series webinar. As we said, we're starting today with Pete, who will be talking to us about Daring to Dream. It's quite quite a project. Um, and then every two weeks on Thursdays at this very same hour, uh, we'll have five other experts coming in uh, to talk to us about different topics. So um, in two weeks on Thursday, the 7th of October, uh, we'll have Christian Dumas, uh, who will talk about marine um, uh, and weather and routing, uh, which is obviously an important topic when you want to go around the globe. Uh, Loïc Elias will be talking to us about technical boat management. So Loïc has actually gone around the world once and, uh, and uh, he's an airline pilot and uh, it's interesting how he applies uh, what he does as an airline pilot to, uh, to managing a boat while blue water cruising. And then uh, we will have Nikki Henderson. Nikki is a young woman sailor, as she calls herself, herself and uh, she chose to 
talk about uh, a topic that could be uh, could be interesting for those of you who wonder: Can there be more than one skipper on board? We're talking about sharing um, sh sharing roles and responsibilities while blue water cruising. Oftentimes, when when you sail as a couple, I'm hoping everybody can see or hear us well uh, because we have I have a message that says my connection. Uh, is a bit low. So I hope you guys can see the slides. If you can't, please let us know in the chat. Um, number five, we'll have Martin Houdet. He's an urgentist um, uh, uh, doctor. And he will be talking about the basics of medicine on board while blue water cruising. And uh, to close this six-part series of the webinars, we'll have Knut Froschtat, also a very well-known uh, sailor, talking about how digital tools can uh, give us some more freedom on board. So welcome, everybody. You are uh, now 172 connected. Again, let us know if, if, uh, if things are not good on your side. I'm hoping you can see and hear everything correctly because you're connected from all over the world. Um, so let us move on to, to Pete's part now um, with the title Dare to Dream. And he will tell us what, why he chose that subject in a moment. So, Pete, I'll introduce you quickly. Um, oh, sure. <laughs> you're a former Royal Marine, uh, and uh, you've had a lot of projects connected to innovation technology as a, and, and an adventure. You're active in, in a lot of different sectors. Um, and obviously, you've done competitive sailing and, uh, and, uh, and, and raced in a number of, uh, of races. And now you're also a consultant and a speaker. And uh, I would much prefer if you spoke about your experience and told us a little bit more about you uh, with the help of the following slide. And so I'll pass it on to you now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Karen. And uh, hello, everybody. It's kind of weird talking to people all over the world from my, my little room here, but it's a, a real honor to be invited to um, have a chat. And um, uh, funnily enough, PJ from Garcia put this slide together, so it's it's quite interesting. I mean, I've had a funny life. Like I always say, I've I, I've I've never had a career. What I've had is a is a series of daft ideas. And uh, what I'll do is I'll come up with an idea, get all excited about it, and then um, you know try and take it through to conclusion. So very much following dreams, really. And I guess. Um, the talk Dare to Dream is is just about getting up and, and having a go. And you can see there's various projects there, team events, single-handed around the world. Team Phillips, one of my claims to fame is I lost the world's biggest catamaran. <laughs> uh, I've been up to the North Pole, historical projects and kayaking. But bottom right there is Pearl of Penzance, which is uh, really why I, 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 I'm here. And, um, you know, I, I, I'd always said that one day I'd like to go uh, and explore the world slowly. And it took a while for that chapter to come along. You know, life for me is, is a whole series of chapters and it's all about grabbing the appropriate chapter and making the most of it. So really what I'd like to do is chat about that and chat about it. Uh, uh, it's a, a reflective thing. Our trip is done. We were two and a half years, two and a half wonderful years. It's the most life affirming thing that we've ever done. And sat here now i i just couldn't implore you if you have a dream uh then dare to dream and go for it and um i, I just want to chat really on the basis as if you the viewer are, are thinking about going on a trip and and some of the stuff you know i wish that when we'd started there was a webinar like this that um tracy and i could have been a part of so that's Kind of really why I'm why I'm here. Oh, now how do I go forward? Yeah, there we go. So dare to dream. You know they're the fuel of life, and um, I think one of the things about dreams is that uh, unfulfilled dreams can very quickly turn into regrets. And and if ever there's a lesson that we could share with you, it would be to grab your dream and go for it. You know when we we set off. Um, we knew that there was uh, some changes coming down the line, you know, as people get older and various things. So um, um, we we set off and um, we thought we would save Europe in case we had to come back. And after two and a half years, quicker than we'd originally anticipated, 
uh, those changes came along and family circumstances meant that we had to come home. So we didn't actually get to the Pacific, but what we did have was this wonderful two and a half years in the Atlantic. If we hadn't gone, uh, our window um, would have been missed. So, you know, really grab it. You know, COVID has really taught us that um, life is very short. And um, I think the other thing that it's done is it's uh, really made us reflect about freedom. Uh, we lost our freedoms. I think a lot of us took it for granted. And um, one of the things about a, a boat is it, it gives you absolute freedom. And so, yeah, that's kind of the basis of, of what I'd like to talk about. Um, throwing up some headings, your fresh horizons, define your dream, choosing your boat, involving the family and friends, developing as a team uh, and experience brings confidence. So hopefully as I just wander through these, I'll share with you a bit of our journey uh, and things that, that came along. So fresh horizons for us, this was our first boat. So it took us a while to finally um, get to, to how we were going to uh, go off on our two and a half year trip. So the first thing was I, I had to hang up my racing boots and um, I'd kind of been lucky enough to do all the races that I'd wanted to do. Uh, and I had a, a, just the most amazing time. But I always said that the day I stop enjoying it is the day I stop doing it. And um, I, I'd reached that point. So it was time to hang up my racing boots. That was one thing. And then another thing for us as a family, you know, you can go blue water cruising at any time. We, we've met young couples who've just fell in love. Oh, we met some, you, you know, single people. I was a young 16 year old lad who just wanted to go and he got an old boat and off he went. We've come across families with young kids who are who are doing schooling as they go. But for us, with our life cycle, um, we were going in this this um, gap between the kids leaving home uh, and and perhaps some further responsibilities that would follow on. So um, I think with the kids, one of the things that happened was although they'd initially left home, they were still orbiting around us as parents. And then we noticed after a few further years that um, they began to get their own center of gravity and, and we were beginning to orbit around their lives. And it was a kind of tactic permission that uh, it, we, we, were, we were free to go because, um, you know, we all have responsibilities. And it's not just responsibilities, you know, you love your kids and you want to see them right. And um, like I was saying with our, our parents, uh, uh, we saved Europe uh, in case we had to come back, which has happened. So I'm really glad we, we, we jumped at it and, and we went for it and we're we're building another boat now which has been designed specifically for for um uh for europe so really really grab that opportunity i mean for us originally um tracy had hardly done any sailing she didn't particularly like sailing uh, as she always used to say that nothing goes to windward like a 747 so um, for us, I loved the journey. Tracy loved the destination. I mean, I love the destination as well, but the journey is a, a really big part of it for me. So our initial cunning plan was that um, we bought this boat here, 34 foot Pippin. I second hand, I did loads of work on it. I was going to do the oceans on my own uh, and then Tracy would um, fly in and, uh, and join me for the stopovers. And that was kind of how we were approaching it. Did a big refit, learned a lot with the refit. Uh, I think there's, you can get a new boat, you can get an old boat. Um, for me, I think, uh, you know, a second hand boat's definitely a good way to go, but there was a lot more work involved than I'd originally anticipated. So um, that's something I think if I was going down that route, I would add a bit more time in terms of uh, preparation before going. The most important thing though, I think, in in terms of going on these trips, is to really define what your dream is, what you want to do. Th this is the one thing which is an absolute project built around you. For once in your life, you're not fitting in with a package tour or whatever. And dreams are funny old things. You know, uh, first thing I would say is completely strip away all the romance. You know, that, that romantic notion and... Um, really boil it down to what you want as a couple 
And, um, you know, one of the things everybody should have, I don't know if you can see it, is an inflatable, <laughs> an inflatable globe. Just go and get an inflatable globe. They're absolutely brilliant. And you can sit there with a glass of red wine and look at your inflatable globe and start to map out in your mind where you would like to go uh, and how you would like to do it. And then, of course, as you do the trip, as you can see with my globe, you can actually draw in um, what you've done. So it's a really nice little thing to to remember your trip by but it's i know it's silly but it's a really useful thing so i'd have one of those and the other thing while i'm on the subject tracy had a memory book which is um this is ours look and each day or each year goes along in one of these rows and so we when we do like today we can look up the page and see what we were doing on this day for the previous four years. And one of the things about um, blue water cruising is it's it's um, uh, it's just amazing experience. We had two and a half years of cruising, but it's like 10 years of life condensed in two and a half years. We made more friends in those two and a half years. And I mean, lifelong friends than we did in the previous 10. We saw so many amazing sights that it's very easy for them and some of them to slip. And we, we refer to this memory book um, frequently now. I'll say to Trace, you know, when we dropped that anchor in, in that funny island, so-and-so, what, what was the name of the couple in the boat? And there it is. We've got their email. And um, so, you know, it's a really fun thing to do. Um, so we got Pippin and decided that we should do a training session for when we got to the destination. And we did two months in southern Brittany. And we absolutely loved it. And from that, Tracy decided that she'd actually like to step out of her comfort zone and do the whole thing. So I think one of the things when you go into this is just, you know, be don't measure your ability to where you are now. Remember, you will continually grow and learn uh, and that things that you might feel are unattainable at the moment will feel very attainable as you go down the road. So don't be put off by lack of knowledge or anything like that. You, you can overcome it. People will teach you. You can go on courses and you might say, well, we'll get the boat and we'll do a year of cruising locally and, and build up our, our knowledge base. And um, everybody starts from nothing. I mean, when I my first ocean trip, uh, we, <laughs> we couldn't navigate. So what we did is we followed the vapor trails of the aircraft flying between um, Heathrow and New York and it was perfect we could see them at night and uh, you had these white lines and we just used to tack on the headers and uh, we carried on there on the basis that America would be big enough we'd hit it in the end and we could ask a fisherman whether to turn left or right so that's another thing I would say is don't don't be put off because you don't feel it's attainable you you can get the knowledge such that it is um, and I think it's really important we're all different and it's you do sometimes come across people who will project their project their dreams and aspirations on their partner or perhaps others on the boat. And it's very important just to sit down because as an individual, sometimes you're not truly clear why you want to go and really wrestle it through and find your different motivations, different reservations, different needs, training, whatever it might be. And once you've really got those then come up with a plan that folds all of those things into it because there will be parts you know that one or absolutely of love the other one will enjoy uh, and vice versa but um until you've really nailed down what you want to achieve you'll you'll never find it and uh, i know it sounds silly but um quite often we've come across people who've um got halfway through their trip before they found what what they actually wanted to do and wasted a lot of time. Um, it's a big commitment, this. So I, I, I really, uh, I wouldn't take it lightly. Um, I would take it seriously. Um, it's not easy to do, but good things in life seldom are. It depends on everybody's circumstances, of course. Um, for us, it was a big commitment. You know, we had to sell our house. Um, which we were were very happy to do. But one thing that we felt was very important is that we should have roots somewhere. I really need, you always need somewhere to come back to. I think personally for us, we'd find it difficult.
difficult if we didn't have somewhere, some anchor which we could hold to ourselves. And, and you can see from this picture, we bought a Mongolian yurt, um, which was handmade in Mongolia, shipped it over. We have a little bit of woodland in Cornwall. And so we had somewhere to, to go and stay. And it's fine. All of this stuff is fine. But there does come this sort of moment of truth when you have to consciously um, give yourself permission to go. And I know it sounds rather silly, but um, you, you do, you just have to sit down and give yourself permission and it is okay and it is fine. And, um, and it's partly, I think, uh, there's a natural resistance. And for us, you spend your whole life working hard and responsibilities and bringing up your kids and all of these things. And actually suddenly recognize, well, hang on a minute, we're in a new chapter and, you know, we do have the freedom to go and we've worked hard. We've got the resources. We've got the time. Uh, circumstances are OK. And, um, you know, because there's always a reason not to go. And, and I think you, you, you have to think it through. Give yourself permission and then away you go. It becomes much easier. Um, choosing your boat is massively important because for me um you know what is a boat and and for me it's a um i guess it's a facilitator of your dreams uh and therefore having defined your dream you need to get the right facilitator to enable enable your dream to unfold and um Boats come in all different sizes, all different sh shapes, uh, all different budgets um, in terms of age, size, whatever it might be. And so there's there's a thousands of experts, there's thousands of options. And um, it's very easy if you haven't defined your dream to get the romantic boat to fit with a romantic notion. And it's a complete disaster. So uh, I'd really spend a lot of time choosing your boat and make sure you choose a boat that has a, a perhaps a slightly wider bandwidth than what you've defined because what will happen is you set off on your trip with perceptions of what it'll be and of course reality is never quite what your perception is um, as your knowledge develops and confidence grows you might want to change things so it's really cool to have something that can embrace any future changes. You don't want something that locks you down this very narrow, um, uh, uh, this very narrow option. So we had a bottle of red wine as we do. We always find the answer to our dilemmas at the bottom of, the bo of a bottle of red. Uh, Tracy decided she wanted to do the whole thing. So we thought, okay, in for a penny, in for a pound, we'll sell the house, we'll get the dream boat. Um, we did loads of research, couldn't find the boat we wanted actually started to um, come up with a, a, a campaign to build our own boat I'd done some quite detailed drawings and um, and then I stumbled across the Garcia 45 exploration and um, I was flying back from Australia had a delayed flight in Singapore I think it was I treated myself to a yachting world and there on the front cover was this boat that fitted perfectly what we'd set out and I remember ringing Tracy really excited to say I've I've found the boat you know we don't have to build it uh, and so we bought Pearl of Penzance we called it Pearl because um, it was our 30th wedding anniversary so it just kind of felt like a a fitting a fitting name and one of the things that was very different about this boat compared to my previous boats which were purely functional to a very narrow um, design brief, and that was basically speed. What this boat had to do was also to be our home. And, you know, why not be comfortable? Why not be, um, you know, we were going to live on it for a long time. So let's have all the comforts that um, go with it. We thought we would invest the extra money on a new boat. I, I mean, I know not everybody can, and we were very lucky to, you know, having rebuilt four houses and built one house, we we built up some money which we could cash in and buy the boat. But our experience with the previous one was that um, we we wanted a boat that would serve us rather than us serve the boat, because even though we thought it was in good shape, every start, time we moved forward, we would have something else 
that we, we need to put right. And, and um, so that for us was another, you know, you have all of these strategic decisions that you need to make. Uh, and that for us was one that we certainly didn't regret. Um, one thing I would say there is often you can think of a second hand boat as a cheaper option, but a, a second hand boat, you know, it's, whatever you do is always going to go down in value. Whereas we felt with buying this new Garcia that it would, you know, maintain. And, and so look at your costing. What I'm saying is from beginning through to end, including the sale of the boat. Uh, and we're very glad we did it. You know, when we had to sell her, she sold in six hours and it was at a, a price we wanted. Um, it had to be a very good sea boat. Uh, we wanted to have something, no matter where you go, you will get caught in, in bad weather at some point. And we just wanted this bulletproof boat was safety underpins everything that we do. Um, an interesting thing that came out when we were doing the research in terms of cruising, a formula would be that you only spent 20% of your time sailing and 80% of your time is at anchor exploring and having fun, which to me, when we set off, just didn't feel quite right. I thought we'd be doing more sailing. On reflection, it's about right. And so, therefore, when you're choosing your boat, I would say um, lean more on a boat that's good at anchor and facilitating all of that stuff of having fun in the cruising life. And as long as it can do the 20% uh, it, uh, really safely, then um, you, you, you've got the right boat. Whereas some people I've I've come across people we've met who had always been racing and their their um, default was to get a racing boat and try and make it cruise. And that didn't really work. Uh, so um, uh, and I think for us, really simple, you know, cut a rig, big, strong, have slab reefing for us uh, is it's just felt easier to maintain. That was an interesting thing that came out. This is uh, Jimmy Cornell's Garcia 45 up in the ice. Um, the thing about this boat, because it's really well insulated for these conditions, actually makes it very good in the hot climbs. And um, with the pilot house, there's an eyebrow over the windows so that it doesn't get the greenhouse effect. And we would go onto other boats and find them much hotter than ours. So I'd say there don't be, you know, some people will say, well, you know, a boat designed for the cold climbs would be a disaster in the tropics. That's really not true, provided you have plenty of hatches to give you ventilation. Um, you know, we did want to push the latitude. So we had that option with uh, with Pearl. And um, yeah, she was a fantastic boat. Wanted something that could be big enough to go anywhere, but small enough to be sailed two-handed and we felt 45 foot was about right for 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 two-handed i think you can certainly go up to 50 and then you can go down from that but i just for us felt a, a good size um I, i'd never had a bow thruster before this boat <laughs> and, oh my god they're fantastic and um, particularly if you're coming alongside and there's two of you and you know, Trace has a bit of arthritis in her hands. At least I could hold the boat on and she wasn't having to make great leaps and things. But um, this was a brilliant day. We we went uh, under the Statue of Liberty drinking champagne and playing Frank Sinatra's New York, New York. I mean, you know, every little picture is a big smile and a memory. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just fantastic. Um, this was important. We wanted, um, and this was Tracy very much with this, uh, saloon, much like a multi-hull, you know, you, you, you've you got a view all round. And Tracy said, why would you design a boat to take you somewhere lovely and then live in a cave down below? So again, these are personal choices. I can only share you ours. But uh, what we wanted was then this central living accommodation with accommodation either end of it. So up forward, we had a lovely double bed, which we wanted, and an ensuite. Um, why wouldn't you? That was our private little place. And then back off, there was a double cabin for visitors and a separate toilet. And uh, that worked really well. You know, it sounds silly, but when people join you and they're jet lagged, at least you can leave them be and get on with your life. A big thing then, because I was still working uh, consultancy, I, well, you can see there I could do a lot of work on the boat. Um, but I did have to fly off on jobs quite a lot. And um, security was important for Tracy and Marina. So when I went away, we always parked in a marina. 
and um, with with our boat, you know, the Garcia, we had these great big, um, they're like submarine doors, which you could lock down. And, and that f gave Tracy um, a great sense of security after an experience with our other boat, which just had pretty poor uh, washboards. Lots of storage. Again, uh, most boats now, I think, are designed, rightly so, as weekend or maybe one week, two week trips. And they're designed to coexist, co coexist with marinas. So they have very small tanks, loads of berths, um, not much capacity. Whereas if you're going cruising as we want to do, I mean, look at this picture. Though That's um, up in Maine. And we disappeared up in Maine uh, for a month. And um, I, I think we only stopped for stores once in that period. It's absolutely amazing. And so it really gave us the confidence to go out and enjoy these remote places. And um, uh, yeah, the, so these little things are very important. And have, we could take a ton and a half of fuel, which gave us huge range, but it also meant we only filled up with fuel when we knew it was absolutely clean. And also it was cheap. So we only filled up with fuel, you know, a couple of times a year. Um, redundancy, we had loads of redundancy in this boat. And, um, you know, aluminium, very good material. I absolutely love it. Watertight bulkheads, twin rudders. So you had a spare rudder there if you lost one. And the centerboard was really key for us. It meant that um, the boat was quite shallow if we required it. Great out in the ocean sailing, but then we could creep up into shallow areas, which other boats didn't have access to. And that really enriched our experience. And um, uh, it, it also makes the boat much more controllable downwind. So these are things that played a part in our decision. The final one um, was it was a boat that had three legs. So Jimmy Cornell, all his experience, absolutely fantastic. Why wouldn't we want to it? Um, Garcia make a great boat. And then Grand Large is the overall archery uh, company. So we knew we were putting our because you are giving people your life savings and uh, we, we knew we could really entrust it and um, I think then we wanted a boat that could change gear and this picture you know we, we've got on the left there that was where in a um, the where the pen is pointing there's a hurricane hole up in Maine and we're tucked in there with this I can't remember which one it was this huge hurricane that came up through and devastated Nova Scotia so you know we wanted a boat that could take us into these areas and be really safe um, but also picture on the right that's our oldest son doing a barbecue in the Bahamas so you need a boat that can cover a whole range of, um, uh, of conditions that will come with blue water cruising and uh, you know we had a technical room uh, very easy to get on and off with a dinghy from the back of the boat you will in your choice go down a philosophical route do you have washing machines or all these sort of things well we didn't we we had a very simple boat if it's not on there to go wrong then it won't go wrong and um it worked fine you know there's laundrettes we had enough bedding to last for a month and then we could do one big wash but these are you know things that you do have to think about and and i guess i'm making that point in is that every decision is if it's if it's okay for you then it's the right decision and, um, you, you know, so it sometimes comes down to philosophy and you'll have people perhaps trying to force uh, what they think is right on you. Well, you, you know, just stick with your guns. I think a big thing about this we certainly found was um, managing uh, friends and, uh, and particularly family. And um, we really felt that the thing is, not everyone will, and work colleagues, not everyone will be able to relate to your yearning for a free and open horizon. And um, if they don't really relate to it, they find it very hard to understand why on earth are you tearing yourself out and going off and it's mad and high risk and, and all the rest of it. And we, what we didn't want to happen was people who were struggling like that can sometimes end up begrudging what you're doing. And uh, and so we spent a lot of time um, bringing people along. And, um, you know, we did that through um, 
giving them books. You know, there's some wonderful cruising books which you could give them as a present. They could read and start to get an idea. We, we would forward them YouTube videos just to say, oh, have a look at this. And then they could say, oh, yeah, that's really cool. I'd love to do that. And then silly things like a big launch party because you, you have all your friends in various areas of your life. Bring them all together, have a big ding-dong party, and they can become a part of your trip rather than um, feeling abandoned and, and begrudging it. And then I think once you've gone, um, it's really cool to have a website. They're very, very simple to do. And um, what that does is means that, that they can come along with you uh, and make it a very honest website, the good news, the bad news, put it all in there. And they can live vicariously through your trip. Little things, empathy. You know, we had a, an old relative who wasn't really um up to speed with technology so we found a one of the youngsters we used to print they would they would print the daily blog off it wasn't every day but you know they they print it off put it in the, we gave them a load of stamped envelopes and they would put it in the post and so you know she could open this letter every day and read it and she absolutely loved it whatsapp was fantastic and that's the other thing is is reassure people that you're not dropping off the edge of the world far from it um you know they can come and join you um trips home originally we thought we would come home for one month a year as it transpired we'd sometimes stay for two months it's that's the thing it's a totally flexible thing of this way of life so don't get too rigid um as as you move forward and um this picture, I love this picture. This is our, our daughter and, and that's Tracy on the right. And Livy, although the kids were really behind it, genuinely behind it, Livy still didn't quite get it. And she came out to the Bahamas and uh, it was lovely. She took Tracy aside and said, now, mum, I, I really understand why you're doing this. And I'm so proud of you and, and, and what you've done. So you know, just bring them along and they can be part of it. And I think one thing I would say is when you're uh, certainly in the Atlantic, you, you're never more than 12 hours away from from home. If you rush, you know, you can get on a flight um, 24 at the most. Um, but obviously crossing the Atlantic, which is a big part of your mind, um, uh, people get this perception, well, you'll be lost in the middle of the ocean. Oh, my God, you know. But actually, uh, a, a good 40, 45 foot boat will do the crossing in um, 20 days, say. And so the longest you'll be away is a diminishing 10 days from the middle. And um, that's not much. You know, obviously, the ocean crossing is a very big part of it. But for us, it was only uh, three weeks of a two and a half year trip. And um, one thing we found with visitors is rather than giving them a destination and a time as we would say because you're only doing five miles an hour uh, sometimes and you have weather against you it's hard to plan so we would just say look if you really want to buy, buy your flight get it to the hub and then two weeks before you fly we'll tell you where to go to and they can get on a bus or a train or a plane that does you know 70 miles an hour or whatever and that seemed to work really well um <laughs> PJ, who's done these slides, wanted a, a, a picture of an emergency. So this is me on the single-handed round the world race. I had to do an operation on myself, but it was the only picture I could find. But one thing I would say is that we found was very useful is we appointed a friend. He's a very good friend who became our central point of contact in case anything went wrong. And what he had was a crisis management plan within which we laid out the details of the boat with a picture, ourselves, age, date of birth, passport details, any medical, we didn't have medical issues, but you know, if you had them, you could put it down. And also a prioritized contact list so that if something happened, I could just call Stu and say, Stu, I'm really busy. Can you disseminate this and I'll come back to you? Or if our EPUB went off, then the emergency services would contact Stu he could send them all the details that they might require and then coordinate things between us, them and families and friends. So put a little bit of thought into that. Um, 
and uh, you, you know you probably never have to use it but um, it's useful to have because it helps you get it all straight in your mind and have you got the right medical packs and details and things and then I think uh, evolve as a team you know this is something that's really important boats are always ready but never prepared you know you you'll never be fully ready and um you can just go, you know, and just go around the corner to the next bay and have a cup of tea and some scrambled egg and a good sleep and then um, take baby steps. Um, or like I said, if you're building your knowledge, uh, then perhaps you might do a year of cruising locally before you move on. But the most important thing is to discuss everything and um, and really discuss them in an open, honest fashion, all your worries and fears and things. And one thing that we had that was really useful was was a red card system. So if either of us just felt that, you know, we shouldn't be going there or doing this and couldn't really articulate it, it was an intuitive thing. We just had a red card and say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I just I'm going to pull the red card on this. It was never questioned. Fine. The red card was pulled. But we would discuss it afterwards. And we did pull the card a couple of times. And funnily enough, the intuition was was pretty good um differences stay in the cockpit that's tracy's thing not that we had many but um you know leave it in the cockpit you're going out there to have some fun but uh one thing i i i would say is that uh often when people set off and certainly in our case there was a huge disparity between myself and tracy in terms of experience obviously i'd done loads of sailing tracy'd only done two night sails and so one of the key things then was to always talk. If ever I was making a decision, uh, I would uh, run Tracy through it, explain it, get the weather up so that she knew all the options. And this is why I felt we should do that. What do you think? And what happened over time is that disparity started to level up. And, and I think that's, to me, a skipper's goal is to take the crew and the boat collectively to the point such that should you fall over the side and be lost at sea, there should be no day-to-day -day effect to the performance of that vessel. And knowledge dispels fear. So the more you imbue knowledge, then the less fear there will be. And then don't be silly, you know, don't start in bad weather. You don't have to be rigid. We had a very relaxed watch system we always had regular meals tracy hated night sailing so i would do most of that she would cover me during the day i mean her first night watch was 20 minutes but you know later on she was doing full night watches and things so a bit of empathy a bit of care a bit of coaching and you'll both end up on a par and that's your strongest point really but um you won't get to that point at the beginning of the trip well you could but you would lose so much time having fun so just manage it um play to your strengths um have clear areas of ownership I, I love this picture but i mean the thing is running the vittling on a boat is a really complicated and difficult subject and tracy is absolutely brilliant at it it covers the medicine it covers um you know food that's going to have to last you for months on end um, uh, it's just Tracy can even tell you the best steel to use uh, for your cutlery to be made of and um, so what we did was we played to our strengths and gave she's just not interested in an engine she can do what needs to be done but just not interested whereas I really quite like them so I got to know the engine really well <laughs> um, and uh, I think there is, that's your responsibility. I can comment on it, but not decide on it. And likewise for, for my side. And be kind to yourselves, you know, celebrate in, uh, don't cry over the mistakes, but celebrate in the lessons. And learning is one of life's great joys. Uh, and so, you know, really enjoy, enjoy building up this knowledge. We found that um, pace was difficult initially when we set off we found we were absolutely knackered. I say, oh, Trace, we can't be knackered. We're on holiday. And then I went back through the log and we'd spent two months doing the equivalent of a, a night sail every other day and a channel crossing every day. And we thought, hang on a minute, holiday pace is unsustainable. Let's slow it all down. Have aspirations, not plans. 
we found the slower we went, the richer the experience. And let chance play its part and get all the toys. I love my fishing, diving. You know, we used to go off on the paddleboard here was a wonderful way to meet people. And when I talk about chance, this is a, a big warship in um, uh, down in Chesapeake. And uh, it had this amazing bow. And I paddled up there. And there was a naval officer walking along the footpath. And I shouted to him, well, have you got a camera? Took a picture. Um, uh, he then came and had a drink on the boat. And the next thing we knew was that Saturday we were having a personal tour of, of um, one of the Nimitz class uh, aircraft carriers. Mind blowing. And so we found the slower you went, the more you integrated with locals and the richer it became. And what would then happen? We got to Maine met a fisherman i was on the paddle board i helped them for three hours catching their pulling their catch in and they were saying look we're going to tell you a secret anchorage that only we know and and so you you end up this this necklace of pearls and each pearl would give you the next one and the next one so that was just a little reflection experience brings confidence can be hard work you know you're servicing the boat you're repairing it but um, buddy boating. Find a buddy. This this picture here is we made some that some of our our best friends actually uh, joined us, Ian and Michelle. And this is going down the um, intercoastal waterway. And the other thing is consider events. You know, join the Ark or or this World Odyssey that um, Corinne was talking about. That kind of event can be a really good introduction. Um, into these things little things windy i found was excellent there's loads but personally for that we had two modes of travel we would have a delivery where we would push hard to a location and then we would slow down to the cruising mode and um this is a lovely picture this is the calm before the storm so the hurricane is due to hit us the next day i sent the drone up and look at that fantastic hurricane hole um be very wary of Facebook and these, um, you know, these various mediums. They are fantastic. Do use them. But people have a tendency, a bit like fishing, as soon as the fish is caught, it gets bigger in this telling of the story. And people do tend to over exaggerate things. And we had some friends who who were always worried because of Facebook and um they joined a group going across uh, the Gulf Stream to the Bahamas. They got to the other end. They had a lovely trip. And then they looked at the Facebook um, uploads that the other people who'd done the same trip. And they were thinking, oh, my God, what, what on earth are they writing about? It was a lovely trip. And they were describing Arbengeddon and all sorts. So just be a little bit careful. We joined the Ocean Cruising Club. Absolutely fantastic family. Uh, they're a huge resource. They're wonderful people. They're all experienced. They're very generous. And um, uh, we found them a huge help. And I think that was all I was going to say, really. I mean, um, uh, I'd, uh, uh, you know, life hangs on a very thin thread. And if you're going to do something, do it now for tomorrow is too late. Uh, but my dad was a real character and he always used to say that... Um, you know, you might think you own your car and your house and your shirt, but you don't. The only thing you truly own is time. Now spend it wisely. And uh, as I get older, I start to realize what fantastic advice that is. And, you know, you look at COVID and our loss of freedom and these various things and life ticks on. You've got to grab that window. And and I, and I hope this talk, A, you've enjoyed it. But perhaps if you've got that dream nurturing around in the back of your mind is is grab it and go for it. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. So, Corinne, I think you've got questions. Am I, I yes, haven't got any time to we do, Pete. Thank you so much. And what a lovely quote. I, uh, I think uh, a lot of us will, uh, will try to remember it. It was very, very nice. So thank you for this, uh, this wonderful session. And right. uh, so we do have, a, we do have a, a few questions. So I'll try and see how I can uh get the most of them uh we mark them down as we uh, as we as we got them uh so i don't know if i take them from the bottom or if i take them from the top we'll see what we do here um so people asked us i want to reassure everybody that for those of you who 
came in late uh and i'm I'm really sorry we had a we had a bit of a mishap on the link the first link we sent out so i I think some of you had uh, some issues connecting and uh, i just want to reassure you that there will be a, a replay available on this very channel and uh, you should get an automated uh, uh, um, reminder so i'll start with the first question pierre asked us uh when you mentioned about talking uh, selling your house um yeah. the question was was it because you wanted to buy another one when returning or 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 did you think you would actually not return no 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 we we no we were always going to come back and um i, I mean we have met people who it's a total way of life and they've been at sea for 20 30 years um which is wonderful but for us we 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 love variety in our life and obviously cruising gave us the variety but we knew we would be coming home and like I alluded to, we had some family um, uh, things that were going to draw us home. So for, for, we just needed the, the resource. I mean, it would be wonderful to be a multimillionaire, <laughs> um, but we're not. And, um, you know, we'd rebuilt. So it was more a necessity. One, than... So it was a necessity, but we didn't need the house when we were away anyway. But what we did need was to have roots to come back to. And that was where we had that lovely Mongolian year, which was really good fun. It's such a good time. Uh, Makes for a great picture of story, building. too. <laughs> and, and I'm building the next house now. We've designed a completely off-grid house. And I was driving a digger yesterday. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the next project at the moment. <laughs> Sounds sounds quite interesting. Uh, next question, which uh, which is of interest to us here at Outremer, did you ever consider a catamaran? And if you did, why didn't you choose that as an option? And we have another question. Also, we had an another question along the same 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 line. Actually, yeah, yeah. yeah well, yeah. The, yeah, absolutely. Yes, we did consider a catamaran. I mean, I love um, catamarans. I've had loads of multi hulls. I've had loads of mono hulls. But um, that's where I was saying you need to really go back to your defining your dream. And then having defined your dream, you'll, you'll, you'll be empowered to get the right boat. Um, for us personally, we, we were quite keen to go to perhaps more extreme areas. It transpired we didn't get there, but we had the option to do that. And I felt um, that uh, a monohull would probably be the safest. So... Most multi holes will inhabit that area in the in the middle of the um, of, of the world, if you like. If you hold up your globe, the trade wind area, um, there is a Garcia Explo cat which stretches that. But um, I mean, look, the Utrema are just fantastic boats. I was in the Can boat shows where we met, wasn't it? And yes. uh, <laughs> drooling over those things. And Luick, who's going to do the talk on maintenance, maintenance, the airline pilot, absolutely lovely man. And I met his wife and they've been around the world once. They're going again. And they did the first one on Utrema. They've got another Utrema to go the second time. So it's, I guess it's a personal choice, but also down to what you want to, to achieve. So, um, yeah, Indeed. I mean, like I said, it's a very individual thing. What's right for you is, it's a project, is, yes. is the right way to go. But yes. um, uh, so we have a, a, another question. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, Pete. Another question about um, actually choose uh, along the same lines of choosing the right boat, pros and cons for keel versus centerboard, especially in stormy yeah. conditions. I think our video is off, you guys, but it's just a question of, uh, I think, uh, uh, connection. The signal seems to be a bit low at the minute. Um, um, hoping we'll come back on, on, on the video. Okay, but well, so. um, if I, I not, not want, I'd never won for self promotion, but if you go onto Google and just put Pete Goss Garcia 45, I did, the Garcia asked me to do a video at the Annapolis Boat Show. And in that, I, I actually explain that in more detail. So if you want more information, have a look at that. But um, the, a, a centerboard is, to me, is the way to go. Um, it, it was in theory and it turned out to be in practice. So, but there's a lot of confusion between a centerboard and a lifting keel. So a centerboard has no ballast in it whatsoever. So if that picture of Pearl there, she's fully ballasted, whether the centerboard is up or down, 
Whereas of lifting keel, as you pull the keel up, you lose your writing moment, which is a fundamental safety feature of a monohull. The boat will sail well without the centerboard, but obviously going to windward, the centerboard makes a huge difference. Because you're not moving the, the weight of a keel, it's just rope and pulleys. You're not messing around with hydraulics and all of the insecurities that come, come with that. But what it also means is you can go into all these shallow areas. In terms of rough weather, uh, a centerboard is fantastic because what tips boats up is they trip up on the keel. Um, you pull your centerboard up and the boat then doesn't trip up. So uh, what happens is the center of lateral resistance moved aft if you want to get a bit more technical. But, you know, we found, Trace and I were having breakfast in the cockpit one morning, 30 knots, and we were surfing down a wave at 18 knots. And I only realized it because I looked at the log and the boat becomes quite docile. So uh, it's absolutely um, crucial point that a lot of people don't understand. And the only way I was able to rescue Raphael in hurricane force conditions was because I could pull my centerboards up on Aquacorum. So I, I'm an absolute believer in it. And um, yeah, I mean, share my email at the end of this. So if anybody has yes. any questions, I'm, I'm happy. We do, we, we, yeah. uh, we, we do have a few technical questions. Um, another that came up uh, in several questions was about draft actually um whether you feel like it's limiting uh if you have a 2.5 meter uh draft yeah it's hugely limiting um and uh you have to be careful as living in europe draft isn't quite the issue as it is in a lot of other places these lovely remote like the bahamas all up the yes. east coast of australia and you know when you go off into the pacific it is massively limiting in terms of the pleasure of where you can take the boat, but but also safety. And so with our centerboard, uh, or again, and with a multi-hull, we, we drew uh, just over three feet. So, you know, if you need to get into a hurricane hole, we could get in there, whereas boats with keels couldn't get in them. And um, it, it's a massive safety safety issue. Um, but also, you know, when I cruise around here locally, all the beautiful anchorages of my youth are often filled up with expensive mooring boys, jet skis and all the rest of it. They're becoming quite busy and we love tranquil cruising. And so rather than a tide, a tide line, you have a keel line and none of them can get beyond it. And yet we have these massive estuaries, beautiful nature is, is ours for the, for the taking. I hope that's answered the question. <laughs> I hope it does too. Um, trying to go through and, and get some uh, get some some different things. There's a lot of of technical questions or questions about what boats you you would choose, etc. But as you mentioned, uh, I mean, uh, it's so nice of you to make yourself available to answer more specific questions through through email. So I'm trying to choose questions that that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. will give us a variety and here is one that uh, uh that that is uh, that is uh, interesting uh uh dickens says i think many would benefit from hearing tracy's story her personal journey would be inspiring for many of us i'm sure so yeah. does tracy have any project in telling her side of the story and along yeah. the same line we have a follow-up question with can you explain the red card system a little bit more <laughs> Okay, well, Tracy's shy. She just she doesn't do interviews and she doesn't do webinars. <laughs> she doesn't no. She just won't do them. She never has. She never done an interview um, in in all my sailing career and things. But um, I do a lot of writing, and she um, uh, very much chips in her thoughts there. And um, uh, there's uh, uh, again, on the Garcia website. I was asked to do a series of six. Yes. I think it might be the Grand Large website, the six articles which covered our all our thoughts. And so, you know, those articles, although they're under my name, it's the both of it. Both of us have have put the input in. And um, but you're right. Trace is amazing person. She was the brave one. Um, the the red card system was um, just a it was an enabler that both of us individually had the ability to just stop 
I don't want to do that. Um, and um, and I think that's really important to have that on the boat. And, um, you know, we would discuss every decision. Shall we go or not go? Here's all the information. And and um, I might feel definitely we should we should go. Um, or, or sometimes there would be issues that Tracy would feel, well, we should do this. And when you get that impasse, um, what do you do? And so we, we had a red card system. And, and if it comes to it, Trace could just pull a red card out or I could pull my red card out and say, look, I'm, I'm really sorry, but with greatest of respect, I just don't feel but this doesn't feel right. And sometimes it's just a feeling. You say, yep, fine, red card pulled. And that's it. It's totally accepted. But of course, we'll look back on it and reflect on it and, and learn from it. But suddenly that empowered, we, we were both empowered, you know, and um, and it's sometimes you just wake up one morning and you feel really tired and just you don't have the reserves to, to take on, um, you know, crossing the Gulf Stream, for instance, it's just oh, I need to pull a red card. And the next day we were both like a lion and we went off and did it, you know. So <laughs> it's important so about empowerment and, and sharing. And, you know, um, when I was talking about knowledge dispelling fear, if you look in history, uh, navigation skills, it was a very secret guild. That was how captains yeah. protected their lives because the crew wouldn't chuck them over the side. And so we've always had this very top down structure. And um, what we like to do, or I like to do, is is all my boats is flatten it right out, and um, you know we're a partnership of equals. And so, um, but we have disparities in experience. We did then; we don't so much now. And the red card is a way of empowering um, things. I, I hope that's answered the question. But it's a very yes, yes. It's a positive thing. Don't think of a red card in football. It's a very positive thing. I, I should have a it's, different color. Yes, yes, and and it, it, it's it's a. Uh, it's a, a visual means to uh, to remind yeah. each other that you each other say. And actually, Marcus is asking us a question about couples life on board, and uh, and uh, just wanted to tell everybody that uh, if that's a topic that's of interest and which goes along the line of what you were saying, Pete, Nikki Henderson will be actually tackling that topic. And it's exactly what you said: can there be more than one skipper on board? Which uh, might be. Uh, 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 a question that you wouldn't have asked maybe uh, maybe years uh, ago, but yeah. it seems like <laughs> right. No, of course, it seems and like of course there can, you know, and um, and as a couple, you know, for Tracy and I, it was just amazing. We were like honeymooners again, you know. We were teenagers again. We we got back time together. It was just brilliant time. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Great. So just to to uh, to conclude, if you if you if you would. Thank you again, Pete, for uh, giving us some of your time. I'm seeing that some people are dropping off. Maybe you um, need to go back to 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 work. And it's been uh, it's been already uh, a little bit over an hour that we've been uh, chatting together. So just wanted to remind everybody of the of the next session about uh, about uh, weather and uh, marine routing with Christian Dumas uh, in uh, in two weeks. And uh, just wanted also to give you maybe uh, maybe the results of our polls. I did three little polls during the course of our session, uh, just to keep people uh, um, uh, sharing uh, and and to give everybody the the, the numbers back. So uh, from the people who were connected, I asked, uh, "Have you already gone on a blue water cruise?" And 73% of the answer of the of of, um, of of people who were watching us said no. So you're still thinking about it. Uh, yeah, I asked, um, how long would you think about staying and get this, Pete? 77% answered. The, the, question, the question was between one, two, and three years, or as long as I can. And 67% uh, answered, as long as I can. Right. So that's so interesting. And uh, and then um, how close are you to from from setting sail? Uh, and most of our of our of uh, of the audience here uh, say they're either close enough. Some it's like uh, within the next two years for thirty percent, and then forty percent it's like three years out. And some say fifteen percent say I'm still only dreaming uh, so far, but who knows? So we definitely hope that. Uh, this webinar will get you from the 
dreaming about it to who knows, maybe I can do this myself. And uh, thank you again. You had a lot of comments saying how inspiring you were during this webinar, as always. And so thank you again. And for everybody who came in late, you can watch the replay uh, very shortly. It will be up in a few hours. So thank you again, everyone, and hope to see you in two weeks for our next webinar. Thanks. <laughs> Fair winds, everyone. Fair winds. Fair Thanks, winds. Bye-bye. Thanks, Pete.